And without um, any further ado, I will. I, I don't have all the bio particulars of Dr. Khalid, but uh, really, in some respects, he needs no introduction. Um, you're about to get an education, an understanding, an insight that you're not going to hear on Fox News. You're not going to hear on MSNBC or CNN or very other. This is the person that's going to give you some insight to tell you how deep the tentacles are. And beyond that, what is in their thinking? What is in their mindset about what they feel about the Islamic faith and what they're feeling about our nation? So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Khaled Abu Fadl. UCLA School of Law, and uh, among the subjects I teach uh, are um, law and terrorism and national security law and things like that. Um, anyway, the, there are several critical points that we need to make in um, in a time that can only be described as tragic, um, uh, unpredictable, no. Uh, in fact, this has been in the making for a considerable period of time, uh, and the, the ideological premises and the ideological roots of this uh, has been uh, explicitly stated and, and advocated for a considerable period of time, uh, we are seeing really the moment of execution. I'm going to start with the issues of, of what we are actually seeing right now and then perhaps backtrack to the issue of roots. It's important to keep in mind that we are facing uh, several distinct legal steps. The executive order uh, that excludes Muslims from certain countries under a general unspecified uh, uh, invoking of a section of uh, the INA, the Immigration and Naturalization Act, which is section 212F, that this group of people poses a danger to the United States. According to the executive order, uh, that this group of people poses a terroristic danger to the United States. And the executive order spells out a procedure upon which the Secretary of Homeland Security, Secretary of State, and the Director of National Intelligence are supposed to report to the President on which countries uh, pose that, uh, nationals of which countries pose that type of danger, and then the nationals of these of the specified countries would be excluded from the United States or rendered inadmissible. Well, interestingly, the, the, the terms of the executive order, the procedural terms of the executive order are not followed uh, by their own terms. Uh, everything moves very fast. Um, to my knowledge, there is no report or study prepared by uh, Homeland Security or Secretary of State or, and so on. Uh, and we simply have a listing of the countries, uh, Syria, Sudan, um, uh, Yemen, and so on. And the nationals of those countries are excluded as a threat to the United States without further 
detail. Now, a separate step is to freeze refugees, uh, Syrian refugees, the 50,000 Syrian refugees, and to suspend what is known as the Overseas Refugees Program uh, for all Muslim refugees. A, a blanket suspension for refugees arriving through the um, Overseas Refugees Program with an exception that effectively the exception is that Christian refugees or refugees uh, who are minorities like Druze or mostly Christian and Druze, um, uh, any religion except Muslim, uh, have an exception. So they might in fact still come in as refugees through the overseas refugee program. Now, the, the part that we had a, a federal court issued a stay on, which to, to my knowledge is not being followed to the letter, the stay is not actually being obeyed as it should, is the part that bans nationals from certain countries uh, from arriving into the United States as a terrorist threat. The executive order said in its ban of nationals of particular countries said uh, whether they're immigrants or non-immigrants it doesn't make a, 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 a difference. So in other words it, it excluded those who hold temporary visas like student visas, tourist visas, whatnot, um, and also permanent uh, resident holders, uh, green card holders. Um, Homeland Security initially said, told the White House that, well, we shouldn't include green card holders uh, in the ban. The White House insisted on it. That's what they started implementing. And now I hear that the White House is going back and saying, well, we're not going to include in the ban uh, permanent residents. This is all in, in just around this whole mess of the very recent executive order starting the process of, and I emphasize starting, commencing the process of doing what has been a declared stated goal repeatedly, uh, repeated in a variety of contexts in the past decade of stemming what is seen as, or what they claim to be, uh, a form of stealth jihad. Um, and in, in their imagination, uh, that Muslims are waging a stealth jihad to overthrow the U.S. Constitution and, over, and take over and destroy the West uh, by doing what? By uh, immigrating to the West in large numbers. And they're again quite explicit that Muslims uh, are, in, in the thesis is known as the thesis of Islamic exceptionalism, that Muslims are, don't follow a religion as a religion is known. That Islam itself is not a religion, it's a, an ideology more akin to a political ideology or a philosophical ideology instead of a religion, they insist on this point, and they insist on this point because that then makes Islam not uh, covered by the constitutional protections against discriminating uh, on a religious basis. Their, their argument is, well, when, when we discriminate against Muslims, we're not discriminating religiously because Islam is not a religion in the first place. It's a political ideology. And uh, uh, they seize upon, they, they love to quote the writings of Sayyid Qutb um, among the writings of 
various Muslim apologists uh, and ideologues that Islam is a way of life, a complete and total way of life. And they say, well, look, see, if it's a complete and total way of life, that's not a religion, that's an ideology. And as an ideology, uh, more by, akin to communism, or, um, and they often draw the parallel between Islam actually and fascism, to be quite honest. Uh, uh, that then it is not uh, it is not covered by the various constitutional protections that we afford religions, and then the argument goes is uh, there is this massive conspiracy that is championed, led, and, and they they have not they. In very, uh, through the years, they weren't quite clear by who's leading this international, uh, worldwide conspiracy according which, to which Muslims are to planning and organizing and plotting and conspiring to take over the world. Uh, at, uh, initially, in the very beginnings, in the early 90s, uh, throughout the, the decade of the 90s, uh, they would just simply say Muslim extremists, Muslim jihadists. Uh, later on, they included the term political Islam, but not to make a long story short, uh, more recently, and especially since the Arab Spring, they're focused on their, the, 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 the conspiracy being led by the Muslim Brotherhood, or the Ikhwan. And so, to recap the argument again, is that the Muslim Brotherhood, which is claimed to be a very powerful international organization uh, with uh, arms and branches everywhere, uh, is leading, is, is the sort of the first, is the, is the uh, grand god, like god figure of the notion of political Islam, and political Islam is really in its essence, the true Islam, and that Islam teaches its followers uh, that they must be the supreme and the, the ones in control wherever they go, and that Muslims must bide their time and pretend to be what they're not until they are in a position of sufficient power to apply Sharia law and to apply the, the Khilafah, to, to enforce the Khilafah, and basically to take over. And now here is where I get to the more important and pertinent part. For a long time, uh, during Obama's administration, uh, in their writings, they insist that every conceivable uh, Muslim uh, body that is part of civic society, uh, so in other words, every Muslim organization that is active in American civil society, and they're quite specific in saying organizations such as CARE, uh, ISNA, ICNA, MPAC, um, uh, MSAs, uh, MSAs is something that they, 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 they harp on all the time, Muslim student associations on all campuses. They insist that all of the, and this, uh, since the, the Arab Spring specifically, that all of these organizations are but extensions of or branches of the Muslim Brotherhood. That all of these organizations get their orders, their marching orders, their instructions, their strategic visions um, from the Muslim Brotherhood, which is, to say the Muslim Brotherhood is somewhere. No one exactly knows where, but they insist that the Muslim Brotherhood is somewhere making plotting and planning and, and organizing all of that. Um, 
not to, I mean, if you, uh, the Jihad Watch has a, a, a list of recommended books um, to save Europe and the United States, save the West from what they term or describe as the Muslim invasion. Uh, and uh, if you read even a few of the recommended book, uh, recommend their list of recommended books, uh, you, you get the thesis very quickly, the, the idea very quickly that uh, the, the, uh, even a Muslim that is safe at a certain point in time, at any, at any point, at, at, at any point during their lifetime of that Muslim, if that Muslim starts to want, uh, ha has a desire to learn his or her religion, uh, they will become radicalized. And they will become radicalized because once they start reading the Quran and the Sunnah, they will very quickly learn that they, as a Muslim, must dominate, must control, they must be superior in a position of superiority vis-a-vis -vis everyone else, particularly Christians and Jews, and that they must overthrow the constitution and that they must over implement Sharia law. And then at that point, that Muslim will immediately be recruited by the Muslim Brotherhood and then become part of this international conspiracy it's uh, so on and so forth. So now the, the, the part that I want to talk to you uh, most fervently about, because this is yet to, to come. On Friday, Trump is going to sign an executive order declaring the Muslim Brotherhood a foreign terrorist organization. Now, this is quite important legally, and for legal reasons, uh, it will have very widespread damage. The way the law works, in fighting terrorism, we have two basic categories. We have a domestic terrorist organization, and we have a foreign terrorist organization. Now, and the law requires the government to say whether it is, to be clear, whether it is acting against a foreign terrorist organization or a domestic terrorist organization. Now, if the government is fighting a domestic terrorist organization, the law affords various constitutional protections that restrains the government from uh, doing what it pleases. However, if the government is reacting to a foreign terrorist organization, then the government basically, in many ways, acts without much uh, uh, legal or judicial restraint. The government pretty much can do what it wants. Now, the way it's going to unfold is in the following. The way you, the government, can go after U.S. interests, meaning American organizations, without recognizing them as domestic targets, in other words, while treating them as under the international terrorist organizations category, is to say that these organizations, although they're chartered in the United States, although their officers are American citizens, in fact, are simply agents for a foreign terrorist organization. So everyone follow me? So you're going to declare the Muslim Brotherhood a foreign terrorist organization, and according to the explanatory memorandum, attached to the executive order that will be signed Friday, the explanatory memorandum says quite specifically that uh, we are going to go after not just the Muslim Brotherhood, 
but we are going to go after all the agents and branches and arms and interests of the Muslim Brotherhood everywhere. Now, you might very well say, well, you know, I, I don't care about the Muslim Brotherhood. You know, they want to fight, pick a fight with the Muslim Brotherhood, let them. Who cares? That's fine. But that, and I would tell you that I don't think they themselves care about the Muslim Brotherhood. I think the Muslim Brotherhood is just a, 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 a trick, if you will, an aid, a tool. What they're really interested in is killing off these, what they see as an emerging Muslim engagement with civic society. In other words, an increase of uh, um, uh, Muslim acclimations to the mechanics of democracy and dynamics of civil activism. As long as Muslims are building mosques and you know eating their weird food and dressing uh, in their own weird customs and uh, you know when they are unhappy about something they go up and protest with English that is not entirely correct they, they, that's fine what they become very concerned with is when Muslims become adapt and uh, learn the, 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 uh, uh, the dynamics of political engagement. And since the 90s, in their writings, uh, spear, spearheaded by people like Daniel Pipes and Robert Spencer and Stephen Emerson, and these are sort of the intellectual ideologues, they see that as the most dangerous uh, manifestation and the reason the MSA in particular is a is a sign of um, is a is a is a, a clear target for them is that they in their in their understanding uh, to have Muslims learn activism on student campuses and to be present in a vocal way on uh, university campuses and to enter the dynamics of making an Islam a living, lived experience for university students rather than something remote and alien and uh, uh, rather archaic and, and, and so on is, is, is threatening uh, um, a possibility. And so for a, a long time, and there's a long history uh, of various uh, legal and political, political wrangling had gone on about the MSAs. It's a very long and complicated story that we don't have time to, to tell. But what the designation of the Ikhwan as a foreign terrorist organization then allows them to do is to simply say, well, the ECNA, ISNA, MPAC, MSAs are all branches or agents or representatives of the Ikhwan, and then be able to crush them uh, in, uh, quite methodically and quite quickly. And the reason for that is the way the law is structured. So, the one, they would be able to go to something called the FICA courts to get uh, a writ uh, enabling them to survey any of these organizations or any individuals associated with these organizations or even individuals that attend the events of these organizations without limitations. Now, here's the thing about what is called the FICA courts. They've never say no to the government. In their entire history, they said no twice. And both times, it was because the forms were filled incorrectly. And the, the government just refilled the forms and they got their permission. So that means then 
they get to see everything, they get to tape everything, they get to collect information not just about the officers in these organizations, but about you, anyone who attends any event by any of these organizations. Two, that gives them the power of what they call sneak and peek, where the, the government can break in without a, uh, any form of judicial approval, can sneak, literally, um, look at documents, take copy of documents, and, uh, and doesn't even have to inform the organization or the individuals uh, that they've entered their premises or that they've seized anything from the, the premises. Now, all of this is in the realm of surveillance, but then it gets more frightening. The three, government can freeze the assets of the organizations, the officers of these organizations, and anyone they deem to have provided material support for these organizations and you can freeze the assets, so you would not have access to your money. You wouldn't be able to, to withdraw anything, spend anything, do anything. And it's a long, protracted process before you can actually get a court to rule on the merits whether you should have access to your funds or not. Now, in previous cases, Assets have been frozen for three up to five years before we even got to a hearing on the merits, before we even got a court to say this is a wrongful freezing of assets. Four, the law enables simply by saying that you, although you yourself, you are not a member of the Muslim Brotherhood, but either by saying that you are an agent of the Muslim Brotherhood or that you've given support. Now support could be, what material support is a very legal, legalistic concept. How have you helped the Muslim Brotherhood, which is, as I, as I said, designated now as an international organization, uh, but the government can arrest you, detain you, and hold you without having to present its evidence of having rendered material support for a considerable period of time. The way the law works is it can arrest you, it has six months, and then it can present its evidence that you have, in fact, rendered material support. Now, not to the Ikhwan necessarily, but simply to, to an organization that they claim is an agent of the Ikhwan. So let's say they're claiming impact is an agent of the Ikhwan. And let's say you've donated money to the impact. So the government can detain you, hold you, and then present the evidence in summary form, in camera, in camera meaning in chambers, in secret, to a judge. On the basis of that, the judge can renew your detention, and to make a very long and complicated story uh, short, you can be detained up to three, five years before we even get to a trial on the merits, before we can actually vet out now, in cases, in a variety of cases where the government has held people as a material witness, and this is another category, that they can claim that you yourself, you didn't provide support, but you as a scholar, you as a researcher, you as an activist, you are a material witness to events involving a foreign terrorist organization and its agents. Now, the law that means, uh, the law allows the government to come and detain you as a material witness, and if you say, well, I, I don't have anything to testify about, if they disagree, they can continue holding you as a material witness, and we go back and forth before a, a, a court, the government uh, uh, not showing its cards, so to speak, until a judge gets sick of the government sort of 
playing with the court and says, okay, well, you either tell me exactly what you have on this person or I'm releasing this person, but in previous cases that we've gone through, because we've gone through a number of test cases in the 90s and in the first decade of the 21st century, uh, people held as either material witnesses or people who've provided material support or uh, um, it sometimes we were able to get to a hearing on the merits in three years after detention, five years after, after detention, but remember was a lot of time was frozen assets um, uh, or even if the assets have not been frozen in cases of material witnesses, uh, it completely destroys the individual because they're fighting the government on their own. They're not receiving financial support from anyone. Uh, lawyers who are working in this field, most lawyers are not working pro bono and uh, you want the best lawyers, not self-proclaimed civil rights attorneys who don't really know what they're doing and lawyers are expensive, very expensive and um, fighting back and forth uh, courts in general are uh, don't know Muslims and don't don't have the facts about Muslims so courts in general on the one hand, they want to uphold the law, but on the other hand, they're, they're terrified of the idea of releasing a terrorist in society. So courts tend to uh, uh, give the government the benefit of doubt um, f for a long time before a court finally says, you know, your evidence on this individual or that individual doesn't really add up. Um, one of the interesting notes that you, and this is uh, remarkably, I mean, it's all been, all been published and it's, it's again, again amazing how the Islamophobic industry just ignores everything that's been published. There have been a lot of studies done on various terrorism-related cases brought by the government um, in the 90s and in the 21st century, and the percentage of them that actually ended up getting to a jury or leading to a conviction is very small. It's no more than 5%. So over 90% of those arrested and having their life destroyed, in fact, end up not having a significant or, or any proven attachment to anything terroristic. But, uh, as you know, Islamophobia doesn't really care about facts. So, now, my final point is I, I think Muslims in, in the United States till now, you know, I, I've stood here in, in this podium so many times before, uh, so many different contexts with this community in particular, and I've said things like, you have to know your rights, you have to become active. Uh, I've said things like, you, you have to you know, learn to buy books so that you become significant in the book uh, consuming market, uh, so that Islamophobes don't get to sell millions of copies, and uh, people who try to clarify the truth only sell tens of copies. And in the past, you know, I've said it all in, uh, with, with a tone of um, uh, lack of urgency, if you will, that, you know, warning you about what's going to happen if things change. Well, everything I was warning about has happened. And we are in deep, deep trouble. Uh, we are in deep trouble since Trump has won, and I will tell you that the Islamophobic industry, while they spent about $130 million to get the, the level of, of paranoia that they've succeeded in, in creating uh, in the West and the United States and so on, 
they should have been outspent by you. I mean, it, it, we, we should have raised the money, mortgaged our homes to outspend them and to get our message across. We don't have, other than ethnic television programs like, you know, a Persian TV station that presents a lot of nice songs and dances and uh, Egyptians have their, some radio stations and we, we are completely absent. We're absent from the political scene, we're absent from the legal scene, and what buds we've managed to create, organizations like MPAC and ICNA and ISNA and so on. Well, ISNA and ICNA are really social organizations more than political. Maybe MPAC and CARE are. These organizations are but weeks away from being snuffed out, literally snuffed out. And I wish I had a better, I wish I was more optimistic, but I think the officers of these organizations, if they're not losing sleep, well, they should be. I'm losing sleep. Uh, because I think they're, they're, the government has uh, dark, dark, dark plans for them. And if, uh, you know, as much as we, as much as the, the, the the real terrorists, the the, the Qaeda the people and ISIS people and so on, uh, uh, help the Islamophobes in, in in numerous ways by just uh, being the actual embodiment of the boogeyman that they always uh, uh, raise. But the the on the other hand, the uh, an organization like Impact or an organization like Care or even scholars who work, uh, scholars like myself, we work all as individuals with very limited resources. I will, and I wouldn't, I, for years, I wouldn't say this publicly, but I'm going to say it because now, you know, who knows whether I'll be able to stand on a podium like this uh, uh, a few months from now. For years, as a, as a scholar, I've been begging for support to be able to be more effective in getting my own research and my own message more effectively conveyed and communicated. And I'll tell you how much support I got. Zero. Zero. I mean, I've got a lot of mumbo jumbo that we all are accustomed to the Muslim community. A lot of dua, I may mean, Allah protect you, may Allah preserve you. May Allah this, may Allah that, uh, you know, a lot of, but zero when it comes, people are very good about spending money on their kids and their families and sending money back home and showing you their latest car and their latest addition to their latest home. I've been invited to many homes where people brag, show me, you know, their extensions, their new this, you know, their new one, but they're horrible when it comes to backing up activists or scholars. And I think now we are paying the bill for that. And to be one final thing, it is remarkable that even the legal stay on the executive order that was obtained on Trump's uh, um, uh, most uh, Trump's uh, uh, exclusion of individuals from countries, uh, it was. If it hasn't been that for the, the, the legal and political activism of non-Muslims, we would even be in deeper uh, zift. Zift is another polite word for crap. <laughs> uh, than we are. There's no time for, there, there's no more space or time for politeness or niceness. Uh, we are all in deep trouble because the, the, uh, uh, the, the two monsters that the Islamophobes have been promising to deliver to us for two decades now, they've actually delivered. And that's it. If uh, we have a little bit of time, if you have any questions.